So welcome to the Civic Leader Podcast. Today's podcast is centered on the creative economy, and it's based on a brief that's published by the Policy Circle. And you can join the Policy Circle community by going to thepolicycircle.org. So why are we talking about this? Well, you know, throughout history, the arts have been indicative of beauty, of human connectedness, prosperity, creativity, freedom of expression. And really by stimulating the senses, emotions, thoughts, arts can incorporate beauty into an environment and give communities a strong sense of identity and challenge the set go. And, you know, in the last year, in 2020, arts and culture have experienced a significant economic setback from COVID-19. Across the spectrum of artistic and creative endeavors, restrictions on gatherings, changes in consumer behavior, and then severe unemployment have really taken a devastating toll on, on the sector. So just to give you some numbers, you know, between April and July 2020, the Brookings Institution estimates a cumulative loss of 2.3 million jobs in creative occupation. 27% of musicians are unemployed compared to, and that's a surprising number, 1% in 2019. And performing art companies saw their revenue fall by 54%. The live music industry saw a 78% reduction in their revenues. So the purpose of the discussion today is for us to understand what are the components of the creative economy with the goal of being really intentional about the role that each of us can and want to play uh, in the arts in our community. So to do this, I'm really thrilled to welcome my guest, Janice Bond. Janice, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me, having me so glad to uh, be in conversation with you um, over such an important um, topic. Yeah. Well, Janice is a perfect person for this conversation. She's you're not only an accomplished, accomplished interdisciplinary artist, and you've worked on many cultural production and experiences across the globe, but your interests and contribution to the arts really stem from a passion for supporting the development of transformative, inclusive, sustainable, creative ecosystem. And you are a volunteer. You're extremely involved in your community and in various institutions, as board members um, and advisors. You were you serve as a director of arts and culture as imam with a focus on using art as a foundation and pathway for community revitalization for both the Chicago Southwest side and in similar marginalized communities around the US. And you were also part of the launch of Art Allies which is an initiative created to educate and develop visual art collectors and art entrepreneurs. And then in 16, you became the director of music and social programming for the Kimpton Gray Hotel in Chicago, then the Hotel Van Zandt in Austin, Texas. And in 2020, you were appointed the deputy director of Contemporary Arts and Museum um, of Houston. The, so, I mean, an amazing experience on all areas of the art. So I'm really excited to um, really share with our audience your experience, your expertise, and really help everyone find uh, their focus and learn the language of uh, the creative economy. So thank you again for taking the time. Um, what I'd like to do is, uh, the way we structure this podcast is really to start by framing uh, what is the creative economy? And then we'll get into a discussion on art in our lives, what has been the role of government, what's art in our communities, and, and ways that people can engage. So I'd like to start by framing uh, the creative economy. And Janice, when you, when, when you heard that word creative economy, is that how you think about uh, the art and the creative ecosystem, or you call it more the creative ecosystem? I just love your reaction to this concept of creative economy, because it takes people by surprise sometimes. Well, you know, the concept of the creative economy um, to me has always been about dimension. Usually when you talk about um, economy, people directly speak to um, just fiscal assets, right? Um, you know, just fiscal economic assets. But when I think about 
the creative economy, I believe that there's just so much more. When you're talking about the creative economy, you're not just talking about, you know, money, you know, of course, although that that has um, a lot of impact, you're talking about development, you're talking about ideas, you're talking about um, creative networks of individuals that are using um, using their thoughts and their ideals um, to potentially solve challenges um, that affect the entire whole. You know, you're not just talking about, um, you know, an artist having an exhibition in a gallery. You're talking about arts integration into the public way and the value of that and how that impacts tourism, how that impacts um, the quality of life, you know, of anyone from any sector um, that lives in a particular area. And so the creative economy is, is to me, not just, is not just the ecosystem that directly is um, developed by and or affects um, artists specifically, but really more so looking at both economically and um, other ways of, of, of accounting for assets, looking at the entire spectrum of the impact of creativity um, within a given space as a whole. Yeah, and uh, just for you know our audience, this term, the creative economy, uh, really came out of a book in 2001 by John Hawkins uh, that's called The Creative Economy, How People Make Money from Ideas. And I think one component about the creative economy and the art process is in an open economy, you, you uh, create a, a creator it's good that arts be that meet the demand of an audience uh, uh, of a marketplace consumers and art is is really that and it, because it it touches everything there's there's different industries there's different ways of looking at art right and um, I think in the brief here it's it's characterized as the heritage industries that are more like traditional cultural expression festival museums. There's visual arts and performing arts, like what we think narrowly about art. But then there's also media. There's books, writers, audiovisual, even new media, digital content, video games. Those are all part of the uh, of the creative industry. And then there's all the functional creations. There's design, interior, graphic, fashion, jewelry, even toys can be considered as artistic creations. And, and then there's all the services, architecture, advertising, some, some uh, research and development and creative, and then cultural and digital services, and distribution component. So when we start to think about it, it really, as you said, touches every dimension of our, our life. It touches, and it touches then how we live and connect as human because it's uniquely human, the human expression. So I think it's a, it's a great way to, um, to define it. Um, Absolutely. I mean, um, and if I may hear, you know, you, you said, you know, every every aspect of our lives. Yes. I mean, and think about it this way. You know, if we really look at it, if we were to really look at it, not just, you know, directly, you know, specifically design or uh, visual arts and performance. But if we were to look at it in an abstraction, then the question is, what is not Art. And, I, and I think I do understand that there's an importance to really categorize things in a more solid way um, so that they can fit inside um, these more traditional funding models, um, you know, and things like that. But, you know, when you really think about it, you know, whether it's graphic design um, to even strategic planning, you know, part of part of my career, a great deal of it has always been around, you know, cultural planning, strategic planning related to arts and culture. And a lot of that, uh, a lot of those um, strategies are rooted in knowledge of finance or business development, um, you know, or marketing. Uh, but all of those things directly impact the arts and other industries. So I really think that, you know, if we just allow ourselves as people to accept the fact that we live in a more creative uh, world than not, you know, Creativity and arts are not the abstract, the aside, the the icing on the cake. That's that's not what the arts is. The arts is like it's a critical and necessary part of um, our human daily interaction and infrastructure. You know, it's what sets us apart from not just uh, country to country or city to city, but from home to home and from person to person. You know, the way that we 
we dress ourselves, we have the ability to dress ourselves, the way we wear our hair, you know, all of these are creative and artistic expressions. You know, it's only when you get to a space where, you know, people are needing to um, place creativity, arts and contributions into models, um, relegate them into different models where we're able to determine who is worthy or what is worthy of uh, funding in one way or another is that you start to pull it apart. But in its purest sense, we are consistently every day um, engaging in and responding to the creative arts. Yeah, and I mean, today with, with uh, technology and communications, we've reached, you know, and, and, and also the ability for people to consume art, we've reached a level of individuality that, that's never seen before in, in human history and our ability to express ourselves for anyone to this democratization of of the creative process and and also just the consuming consuming the uh, the art so i think that's another um interesting um fact that art is really part of everything that we do and you know in terms of economy at a global level it's about like 6.1 percent of the global uh gross domestic product and it averages among countries between 2% and 7%. In the, in the US, employment in arts and culture generated about $400 billion in wages for over 5 million Americans uh, in, in 16. Additionally, uh, economic output in creative economy sector amounted to $800 billion, which included $25 billion in trade surplus for export of artistic and cultural goods and services, including movies and video games. I mean, it's also a, a, it's an international uh, business uh, that sets up a, a part, but also brings people together, I'd like to add. So um, I think this is really interesting. Uh, also in the US, entrepreneurship is, uh, there's a particular focus on entrepreneurship in the creative economy. So there are, in between 2002 and 2012, there's been an increase of the number of businesses that identified as uh, or as employed independent artists, writers, and performers grew by close to 40%. And artists in the US are three times more likely than the total US workforce to be self employed. So it's an entrepreneurial uh, society and economy as well. And, uh, and it, it fuels uh, entrepreneurship and, and relies on entrepreneurial values. Uh, that are the foundation of this country. I'd love your perspective on that because you've been part of a number of initiatives that foster art uh, entrepreneurship. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I think that it's important for um, important for artists, you know, just in general, let's say creatives, artists, creatives, because um, I think shared language is important. There's a lot of politics and language um, and usually with politics, you know, economics is hand in hand, right? And I think it's really important to, to say or note that I believe um, as an individual um, and also as a leader that artists and creatives should have the ability um, to main, develop and maintain a level of economic stability um, in the places in which they live, wherever, wherever they decide to live. Um, they should be able to do that. And that should be um, whether or not they decide to work in or with or alongside any particular institution. You know, so I believe that a curator, someone identifies as a curator, and they are skilled and have studied their craft, they should be able to make a living as a curator in this world, whether or not they choose um, to work alongside an institution. Um, and the same with an artist. If an artist never does a museum show, they should still be able to live, work, and practice. Um, and again, with skill and having you know, the business acumen, they should be able to you know, make a living. Um, and I believe that policies, um, laws, et cetera, um, should really support that, you know, any laws that prevent artists uh, from being able to make and be, especially in the city um, where they live, um, is really challenging um, for me. It doesn't really make a lot of sense because, you know, it's, it's like you have 
um, artists that are contributing to so many spaces and people are bringing them into spaces, into organizations, into projects because of their original thought, not because of something that these artists were boxed in to think about. It was in their free space and their free time, whether they had practiced it before um, or developed it entirely on their own, they're being engaged because of ideas that were developed in spaces of free thought. Well, you expand those spaces of free thought or original thought when there's the possibility for, especially as artists um, journey on in life, you know, in, in age and also, you know, personal social responsibility, you're able to dream a bit bigger, better, more um, when you know that you are able to make a living, you know, continuing those thoughts. And you find that a lot. Um, I remember years ago going to this store. I want to say, um, I know it was in New York, but it was um, in an area that had a, a bunch of small bars. Can't remember at this time. But the gentleman, um, everything that he sold in this very, very little space um, was only from um, these craftsmen in this very specific area of Nepal, just this tiny little spot. And he explained to me that the main reason why he had the store, even though you know business was good, um, up and down, was that he kept the store because he wanted to make sure that the creative economy, you know, for lack of a better word, in that village, that they, they were continuing to um, make these pieces because if there was no longer a demand for this type of craftsmanship, then they would start to do something else. They would start to look for things that, materials that were cheaper, processes that were faster. They would look for other avenues as opposed to preserving um, the high quality craftsmanship uh, that existed, you know, culturally uh, for centuries. And so, you know, he was developing um, this opportunity for them to maintain stability uh, while still being able to pass down, you know, their craft and seeing it as a, uh, a lucrative opportunity or at least a sustainable opportunity. And so that's a wonderful way of, of talking um, about that specifically, but I'd be happily, happy to um, expand on any specific areas um, that you like. Yeah, no, I think that's, I mean, that is a good point. It kind of brings us to kind of art in our lives as, you know, we are experienced. We, there's an experiential component in, uh, in, in, in our life as a citizen that, that you can, you participate in different uh, artistic activities, whether it's being, uh, visiting a museum, going to a concert, or being the consumer of specific local art, or really intentionally connecting with communities that through the art can, can thrive and uh, can continue to earn a living uh, through their craft. And that's something that you have to be very intentional about, either as to distribute that art, but also as a consumer to be conscious of maybe realizing that when you are purchasing a product that is made by an artisan, well, you are helping not only maintain that craft, but helping that artisan earn a living. And, that, and that's part of having art in our lives. And the same goes, I think, around uh, tourism, right? When we visit, it's, it's very interesting that um, art attracts businesses, it attracts also people, and there's there's a whole like cultural tourism is uh, the UNESCO defines it as the movement of persons for uh, centrally cultural motivations, whether it's study tour, performing arts, visiting a craft, as you, you mentioned, learning craft, studying nature, folklore, participating in, in pilgrimages, you know, that type of tourism is, um, is an important part of tourism. And uh, I think in the U.S., um, the, we found that 75% of American leisure travelers have participated in cultural activities while traveling. And over 25% have extended a trip to participate in a cultural, art, heritage, or historic activity or an event. So it's, it's really part of, of what we do and, and we have to be conscious of it. And I think it brings us a little bit and you touched on this with you know how the creative economy functions. Uh, you talked about the, the creators, there's the creators, there's the distributors in, in your example, that store, and then there's also the buyers. 
And there's something interesting about the, the creators. And uh, in, in the brief, we highlight here how when people think about the industrialization in the second half of the 19th century, most really don't think about the art. But the wealth that spread throughout society and expanded the middle class also stimulated the art market because people had more time to devote to the art, meaning creators also had a broader field to work with when they were trying to understand what was meaningful to consumers and how to create meaningful art out of the available resources. So it, it's kind of interesting how a more open, expanded market makes possible, you know, more, makes possible forms of creative individuality that we haven't really seen before in history. And the greater the size of the market, the greater the number of artistic forms that creators can earn a living from. And I think this is what technology brings today is that you can have the, the market can really be uh, the world. It can extend much beyond your own uh, town. Uh, you can sell your product across across states, across nations, and uh, it allows more and more artists to earn a really decent living uh, through, through their art. Um, we can just think of a number of sites such as Etsy and there's arts.com. There's several sites that allow for just distribution of art. Perhaps you, you can share some thoughts here around the creative process and also this access to a bigger market. Well, I also want to, as you were mentioning some of these platforms and sites, I just wanted to, to note that, you know, when thinking about the creative economy, we do better to look at especially and a lot of times things that we're talking about that you know affects um uh art or artistry what we're really talking about you know and, and, and we could only talk about it a, a bit of it at a time different sections at a time we're really talking about what affects usually the hyper local creative economy um not necessarily you know the the artists who are you know selling you know 24 million dollar paintings you know etc cetera, etc cetera. you know you're talking about um, you know, everyday arts workers, you know, the middle market creative economy, um, you know, artists that both maybe work some, a group of them that are working full time, but then also uh, when it comes to visual or performance art, uh, a lot of artists that are working part time, but still possibly in the same economy. So you have a lot of performers who are also, you know, instructors. Um, you know, musicians that are, are, are music instructors, et cetera. And that is a part of the creative economy as well. One thing I want to note is that, you know, a lot of people, when they're talking about resources, you know, to artists and things like that, to me, it's, it's okay um, and great for us to share information about, you know, how, how they can uh, be, how we, as artists and creators can be more sustainable, how we can look at um, uh, financial models, how to do our taxes, so forth and so on. Do you want to have an LLC? All of, the, all of that is great. Um, but it's, it's, it's not just about teaching financial literacy um, and things like that to artists or sharing platforms in which they could sell their items. It's really about making sure that they're supported on a base level um, as creatives um, in the community, in their state, in their country, so that they have the best set of options possible as they're making these decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's, it's everyone that's in debt was not terrible with money. Um, every artist that, I mean, you have artists that had, I know several who had almost a full year of a tour booked you know, or was in the process of debuting their, their first album and had invested in it and, you know, so forth and so on. And the next thing you know, your income for the entire year is gone, you know? So it's not just about right now. I mean, we're talking about the creative economy at a very different time. I feel like we're just turning the corner, um, you know, as things are, are becoming a bit safer in different areas in the country. Um, that are being responsible and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But it's going to be more than, more than artists and us supporting uh, as patrons, as philanthropists, et cetera. More is both and. Yes, support the Etsy's. Yes, support 
um, the pop-ups and, you know, the stream performances and the donations and all of those things. Support them all now without question. But alongside that, it's extremely important for individuals, especially those who may not be directly connected to philanthropy, to find out you know, what your, what your company's, you know, donation policies are, you know, are you able to, um, is the, is your organ, is your company or your organization, um, giving any portion of anything or, uh, support to, uh, creatives or to spaces. If you own a marketing agency or you work at a firm, um, are they able to donate hours or, um, anything to, uh, support a local venue that's struggling, um, that needs to figure out how to do streaming performances so they can keep their doors open uh, for the time being and different things like that. So I think it's, you know, both that direct support, those immediate injections, those cash injections um, and things like that. But then it's also about looking at the ecosystem in which artists and creatives and creative um, institutions and, and businesses are having to adjust now and allowing space for people or, or recognizing that there needs to be more support allocated to those areas for people to actually take advantage of platforms um, that are available to them to generate income. Because ultimately, you know, what I'll say is that some people and creatives and creative businesses, et cetera, are fully aware um, of all of these platforms and opportunities that exist. Um, but it's, how are they going to, to, to manage all of these things, you know, while trying to keep their doors open, while they're trying to create, and not to mention their people, you know, their people too, who are dealing with um, some of the same traumas and, and burnout that every other person, um, particularly in the United States, is dealing with as well. So I want to make sure that I, I, I brought that to the front. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point that you bring up because there is a, the creative process and which requires materials, time, depending on the medium, but it requires space, uh, time to just do the creative process. And then the distribution and artists have to almost be also run like a, a business. It's like, how are we going to distribute it? And what is the platform and how the marketing and how do you reach them? I mean, that, that in itself, it is a whole skill, a very different skill set and also another amount of time that is required to develop. And then it's about reaching um, the buyer. And I think this is where, you know, the buyers and you touched on companies, it's interesting to kind of unpack who are the buyers, right? There's collectors and institutions that are public and private that, that serve as consumers in, in the collective, in the creative economy, there's public museums um, there's private museums, but then, like you mentioned, there's also uh, businesses that may invest in in the creative process. So, for instance, in Chicago, uh, Bernardo Realty Trust is uh, the owner of uh, the merchandise mart, the mart, and they created the largest um, art exhibit, you know, a projection installation in the world with art on the mart. And this was a 30 year public art project um, in which, you know, new media art is projected nightly over like 2.5 acres river facade of the mart. That's a huge investment that uh, this company decided to make uh, into artists and to, into projecting their work in creating a team, anchoring a neighborhood. And that's a big investment uh, that a company did uh, also. Yeah, I mean, what does, you know, I mean, what does art not make better? You know, yeah. every, and it, yeah, I mean, when you're talking about different, put it this way, think about it. If your restaurant is struggling or your retail concept is struggling, what makes it better? You know, some sort of creative thought, design, paintings, um, some sort of sculpture, a mural, all these different things. If you have a, the best coffee shops, what make besides the coffee, what makes them amazing? Their interior design, yeah. their, 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 their the, the, the collaborations that they're doing. Um, I remember uh, Dark Matter Coffee in Chicago. Um, they had a collaboration with a uh, renowned, um, you know, historical uh, a graffiti artist uh, and and uh, 
even formerly like a cartoonist and everything, his name was Slang. And um, he did a mural inside their coffee shop, but then also did a, a limited edition uh, coffee bag, you know, right? And I remember years ago um, at the gestation of Hebrew Brantley, artist Hebrew Brantley's um, public career, I remember him doing a, a collaboration uh, with a wine uh, company. At the time, it was a, a wine shop and a gallery called Three Peas Art Lounge um, in Chicago. I remember his first solo exhibition was there, um, but also he did a collaboration um, with their wine and, you know, just different things like that. I, I think that if there's, some, again, not as keeping art as an aside, I mean, I think about the experience of being the director of music and social programming at uh, Kimpton Hotels and Restaurants. I mean, you know, <laughs> you think about the experience inside a restaurant or a lounge or even in the elevator, um, uh, how it shifts when you're looking at artwork or experiencing curated music and all the collaborations um, and partnerships um, and acquisitions that went into making things like that happen. You know, we look at it that way. It's, it's not just the artist needing uh, help or support. It's if we release the hierarchical thinking of, of creatives and artists and, and other industries, we'll see that it's absolutely imperative that the creative industries and all of the others learn how to work together um, in a more seamless and symbiotic manner in order for things to you know, press forward in a way that is both authentic and sustainable. Yeah, no, that's a, it's a really good point. And it actually, you know, regardless of your business, there you can always introduce art and think of a way of collaborating with artists in, in your community uh, to, to connect with the community. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to just, just be fully part of stitching the fabric of, of a neighborhood and a, and a society uh, through the art. So I think it's, uh, it's it's really fascinating. There's one thing that, and I think you touched on it, about private enterprise and philanthropy. Uh, you touched on this earlier, but in the U.S., um, the philanthropic contributions total close to $430 billion in 2019, and arts philanthropy, specifically in the U.S., generates about $20 billion annually. And uh, there's around, there's about... 170,000 arts-related nonprofit uh, that generates $2 billion in economic activity annually, and individual, corporate, and foundation donors make up about 45% of the budget for nonprofit art institutions, and 12% of their income comes from private grants as opposed to 5% coming from public grants. So this is... Um, really impressive because, you know, it's it, in the U.S., uh, philanthropy fund, funding for, for civil society institution uh, is, goes to everything from Central Park to funding festivals, art museum, uh, art festivals, Michigan, D.C., Utah, all over the country. And I think what's something is really interesting, and I'm sure with your experience you'll be able to comment on that, there's a study in 2017 that found that about 2% of cultural institutions receive more than half of all the contributed revenue. And organ, but organizations with annual budgets of less than $1 million comprise 90% of the nonprofit culture, cultural groups, but they receive only 25% of the funding. So it's kind of interesting, this difference where all of the money is going to very few, to 2% of cultural institutions, when actually it's, 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 it's the vast majority comes from really smaller organizations. And I think this is also a call for, for us and for businesses and communities to maybe look at contributing to those smaller organizations that, um, uh, that innovate and are uh, in the artistic world. Do you have some thoughts on that? Well, absolutely. I mean, I would say this, you know, first, when it comes to, um, you know, private funds specifically, I mean, people have a right to invest and, and donate wherever they like. You know, I, I would say that I'm, I'm happy to see it trending that um, starting to trend, at least that um, it, 
especially the the invitation only um, family philanthropists and things like that um, are starting to look at um, spreading a bit of the support a, a little to other organizations are really looking at their trusts and engaging them in different ways. Um, and that's exciting. I would say this, I mean, if you think about it, every organization, every organization starts somewhere, every, every institution starts somewhere. And, you know, I, I think that it's no surprise that all of this impact and programming, et cetera, is coming from uh, smaller institutions. I mean, there's absolutely no surprise there. I mean, there's, for the most part, there's less bureaucracy. You know, most of these organizations, um, not just because many people are wearing multiple hats, but, you know, many of these people are in these organizations are from, are living in communities, um, have direct ties, are closer to the ground, you know, for lack of a better word. You know, so it's 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 no surprise because what you're having right now or what you're experiencing for a lot of these smaller organizations or institutions is that their programming often is is directly reflective of the conversations and the needs of the community in which they serve. And it sounds like a no brainer, um, but for many institutions, many of the larger institutions um, that I've in, experienced or, or seen or observed over time, um, that, that, that space of being out of touch or really having even the best intentions, but the method of uh, executing or integrating, you know, those ideas or ideals, um, there are many missteps, primarily because the engagement and the prioritization of the community and um, alongside the hyper-local creative economy um, uh, was missing. And so I would say that, you know, right now, um, there, there has been a lot of conversation and movement around supporting and developing um, smaller organizations, you know, through foundations, etc. But I like to also um, place this as, a, as some food for thought, is that there are many uh, organizations, a group, again, going back to the politics of language, um, there are many groups uh, and, and community-based, um, uh, not even institutions, but groups of individuals who are doing the work um, and impacting the community through their arts, uh, volunteerism, et cetera, that may not have an official structure. They may not be a 501c3 organization. I've met groups of individuals that have been in direct service of the community um, for over a decade or multiple decades. And it's because it's something that they felt was necessary, that it needed to happen. Um, and they may not understand the language or even the opportunity that exists. But then again, once again, once someone understands the possibility and the language and, uh, and et cetera of what exists uh, within the possible support of funding from foundations and other uh, groups or institutions, who's going to, to do that cultivation? Who's going to do those filings? Who's going to pay for that? Who's going to activate those networks and, and speak the shared language and tell them you know, what, what this organization or this group is doing? So I say all that to say that I think that it's, it's great that these questions are being asked or you know, a lot of the conversations are starting to happen um, or continue to happen around who is getting support and funding um, you know, organizations and institutions, but even we have to step back a bit and say that at a grassroots level, to have an organization requires a certain level of organization development and financial um, uh, uh, assets to even get started in that way. You yeah. know, so I think that it's really imperative that larger organizations, institutions, and individuals who are truly interested in seeing um, short and long-term impact in communities look at both organizations that already exist, as well as groups that could utilize the support to be developed into organizations that could receive fiscal support as well. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. So it, there's another statistic that, that says that, you know, the vast majority, actually close to 85% of giving in the arts comes not from large wealthy foundations, but from ordinary citizens who see the needs in their community. So it's really 
echoing differently perhaps than, than policymakers do. So it's really echoing what you've experienced. And also, you know, I'd like to point out one organization that was founded by Chris Vroom, it's called Artadia in 99, and it's a nonprofit. What they do is they identify innovative visual artists and supports them with unrestricted merit-based financial awards and connects them to a network of opportunities. So it's, it's completely unrestricted, but what he did is he kind of created this network of people, of collectors, who are interested in supporting these artists and perhaps purchase, purchasing their work, supporting their work, really connecting with, with uh, the, the artist. And then he also co-founded a website that's called Artspace, where it's an online marketplace, again, to connect artists and their work to collectors and institutions. So, I mean, this came from one individual who decided to bring together his friends who are interested in the art and want to connect with one artist in particular and help them thrive and grow. So it's um, I'm totally echoes, you know, what, what you were saying, what you're observing. And uh, I think in the brief, there's also examples in New York of, uh, of things that are being done at the community level, such as the Mosaic Network and Fund in the New York um, Community Trust that brings together art funders and art organization leaders uh, in New York City. So again, we have that much more like local connection. It's a, it's a great model and philanthropy is um, it's so uniquely American and uh, so many people feel that, you know, 47% in one study feel that philanthropy, prefer philanthropy over government to solve some of the social problems in, in America. So it's a big part of the art world. And this Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's important for us to normalize we have to normalize the support of the arts and shift what philanthropy looks like. You know, I mean, to an extent, who's not paying taxes, you know, in some way. And um, I learned early on, you know, my mother was pretty big, um, not necessarily as a patron in the arts, but, you know, she was into, you know, even with modest resources, she was going to figure out whether it was an in-kind or making sure that we gave to, you know, Goodwill or Catholic Charities or a women's shelter, you know, just making sure that there was some sort of contribution that happened every year, whether it was financial or some sort of um, uh, resources. And, you know, as I got older, uh, of course, that transitioned into you know, my, my interest as, you know, a board member or, uh, you know, even if it's just a truly modest donation here or there or getting a membership at different institutions, even if I don't live in town, you know, I've found different ways, um, you know, to support. And a lot of people don't understand. It's like, yeah, it's great to get a membership. It's, it's not always something that is, is nice for your family to do or, or to engage, you know, be able to engage a museum. Um, or a gallery institution, et cetera, but it it supports them. It supports the, them being able to keep their doors open. And so, you know, by having a membership um, at a museum, uh, different spaces, it allows them, yes, to continue to keep the doors open, but also it provides an opportunity for you to enjoy some of the art as well. So it's really um, a value that's twofold. And of course, I'm speaking specifically to museums now, but if you look at it, I mean, even if it's you're moving into a new home and, you know, you want to buy some artwork, no one says you have to have $30,000 to buy some artwork, you know, buy a print from an artist, buy a poster, you know, buy anything, um, as opposed to spending, you know, a couple hundred dollars, you know, at a, at a department store or something on a piece of artwork that they mass produced you know, find an artist that will sell you a work on paper or that's just starting out and you could have some original work um, while also having a, building a relationship with an artist in your community or somewhere somewhere around. So I think it's just changing what it looks like, what it looks like to support the arts, what it looks like to be a philanthropist, what it looks like to be a buyer. You know, if we start to change the narrative and what, what we're seeing and what we're saying when we're talking about those titles, I think that we could normalize it in a way that makes it natural. This is natural. Supporting the art should be as natural as 
buying gasoline for from a pump, you know, as, as natural as it can be, because that's how integrated art and design is into our everyday lives. Yeah. So the process by which we're supporting it should just be that unencumbered. It should be that easy. And it should be, you know, we should be finding new ways every day um, to, to integrate and support, you know, the, the creative economy. Yeah, and I think it, it also ties um, to to education around the art. I think, uh, you know, I think 91% uh, of Americans agree that arts should be part of K-12 education. And, and also like 89% say the arts should be taught outside of the classroom in the communities as well. And it's about engaging the whole family, right? And learn about the creative process and engage in, in the art. And as like you said, not just to appreciate it, visiting it, but being active members of this creative economy of intentionally supporting and building a relationship with, with uh, local artists. So that's um, something that is, I think that, that we can emphasize in, in our schools and, uh, and in educating people about the arts in that sense, not just about how to draw, but how to also be a, a consumer and supporter of the art. It kind of brings a little bit also the question of the role of government. I think, uh, you know, in because art is part of a community's culture and a collective identity, there's a reason for why the government is often involved. In, uh, in the U.S., there was federal government involvement that started uh, in the new deal with the new deal in 1934 and then in 63 Kennedy established the advisory council on the arts and then in 65 it became the establishment of uh, the creation of the national endowments for the art the NEA and one of the things that the NEA did was uh, in incentivize support for the arts at the state level and in 65 there were only uh, 18 states that had um, art councils and agencies. And in 75, 50 states did. And so, so that's kind of interesting. That's very much of a, a, a conscious of um, in, in states that art is part of the economic motor of, of a, a state's economy. And just to give us some reference here, in, nine, in 2019, the NEA uh, distributed about $150 million in grants to organizations and individuals, as well as to state and regional art agencies. What's interesting is that that's a very small number when you consider that the donations to foundations in the arts, cultures, and humanities alone in the U.S. was $17 billion. There's so much more that is being done privately with people with their own disposable income and companies investing um, their, some of their profits into, into the art that is happening in the U.S. And it's really uniquely American. Like if you look at cities around the world, like in, in Sweden, Shanghai, Chensei, Paris, you know, the, the funding of the arts come from, the pub, from public funding at 100%, 80%. But in cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, it's in the order of 70%, 60%. It's so much higher in the U.S. because uh, our civil society and, and our engagement of individuals is, is, is so much greater. So I thought that was kind of, that's really um, an interesting contrast in cities around the world. But one thing that you mentioned earlier is that government can definitely support the creative process and access to the arts by making it easier for people to engage, to export, to import, or even simplifying the rules and regulations that dictate self-employment and permits for organizing public festivals, public art events, or, or just even for artists to be teachers, to work as teachers and, and maybe lightening the load of all of these uh, licensing requirements. Do you have some experience in, in that space, Janice? Well, I remember some time ago, yes, I do. I remember some time um, ago working on um, a project um, while I was on, uh, while I was the director of arts and culture at Iman um, in Chicago. And one of the things I remembered that I enjoyed the most, it was a grant that was coming from um, the Chicago Community Trust. And it was a requirement of that grant 
for any of the awardees um, that were applying, any if they were to become an awardee, they had to apply. Um, multiple organizations had to apply at the same time and, and speak to how they were going to work together collectively. Not saying that their missions were going to be forever intertwined or anything like that, but there had to be some recognition that if they were go if we were going to do a program on the south side or downtown or anywhere in the city, that it was going to impact other institutions and um, create space for artists in the area, performers, visual artists, dancers, etc. And it made us all more aware of what the other groups were doing um, and how they were moving and the resources that were needed. And so all of us weren't all looking for the same type of, of project to get supported. You know, we some of us decided to collaborate on this particular initiative or that particular initiative, et cetera. But what you didn't have was a bunch of organizations um, that were asking for uh, resources to provide similar programming in different parts of town with no connectedness or through lines um, across the city. And so I think that those types of initiatives or requirements are really, are really smart. I'm not saying that everything um, should be developed in that way, but really thinking about um, the impact of those types of models and the possibilities of those types of models, especially when it comes to um, engaging artists. You know, if you're going to, uh, uh, at, a, at a municipal level, approve um, certain developments or, um, and I don't mean just like percent for art. I mean, like if there's going to be, you know, whether it's restaurants or uh, schools, you know, et cetera, you know, hospitals, you know, how, how are you engaging the hyper-local um, create? I would say even, you know, going to going a bit deeper, not just artists, but the hyper-local creative economy, how is it being supported uh, by these initiatives and these developments? Um, and how are you looking at integrating, you know, local artists um, and, and vendors, you know, to support these initiatives or these developments? And so I think at a municipal level, um, whether it's locally uh, up to, you know, nationally, et cetera, there are a lot of opportunities for artists to be better integrated, but also educated um, as far as even the possibilities. You know, every artist doesn't want to be famous. Every artist does not want to, you know, show at every gallery around the world or do multi-million dollar concerts. Um, and I think that there needs to be the allowance for that level of dimension of engagement. Some artists will be just totally happy. Um, imagine if their work was just in print um, at 30 hotels in a single chain, if they were just, you know, these pieces of artwork that were in print, not even originals. I mean, that's still income, you know, many other things. Or if, or if their music played in a playlist that was in a hotel, you know, somewhere that was a thousand miles away or even in their hometown. That's a way of, of sharing the work and making sure that they're compensated for it. Um, but when it comes to like larger organizations and institutions, I think it's just really about larger institutions, foundations, um, especially at a, a, a federal or government level, really bringing more artists to the conversation, bringing more artists to the conversation, not more politicians to the conversation, bringing more creatives to the conversation um, to shape these laws and shape a lot, of, um, a lot of the decisions that are being made that directly affect the livelihood and sustainability of artists. Um, because if you're not doing that, then whose interests do you have in mind? But yet there's still the expectation that things are going to be created, that these assets will still be made available. You know, and yet every time you turn around, there's a story about something else that an arts community has to overcome, including some of them losing their communities. So, you know, I think that that's something that we really need to, you know, think about again, not just the money, but before the decisions are made about even the money that's available or the assets that are available or not, are artists, are creatives being invited um, and heard at the tables that are making the decision, no matter of their political affiliations and or um, their net worth?
think the best way to read creatives, right? If you are, you know, in a city, if you are, you know, in a in in a community, I'm just saying because there's artists in every community. It doesn't matter where you are, right? From the suburbs to downtown, there's some somewhere, you know, there's local policies that specifically attract uh, artists and the creative process to establish themselves in in particular areas of a of a city. But what is the best way to to reach? Um, artists and to invite them to to a conversation what would you say like would be a starting point like what, when you moved to houston and became you know part of how did you how did you really engage and, and got to know where the artists are and how to invite them to the table well one of the things that i would say in the most immediate for organizations institutions or even um, municipalities that are looking to more authentically um, engage uh, artists, creatives, uh, for the sake of both impact and um, development, is to start with um, the start with the ability and the uh, desire to listen and learn, because you may have your own agenda, you may have something that you want to do that you think is great, you know that that may be. Uh, you know, fantastic, you know, for the larger vision of this, that, or, or anything else. But if you truly want to engage um, an artist, a creative, or anyone, uh, for that matter, um, for, for something, uh, I think it's best to find out um, where, they, where they are. How has their experience been thus far? Um, what has been their triumphs? What has been their, their, their blues, their jubilee? You know, especially within the past year and a half, two years, how they experienced, you know, for many of them the past, you know, four years, how have they experienced this, this world as a creative um, and, and what would they like to see uh, different? Where are the areas of opportunity that they've uh, uncovered as groups or as individuals and really start there. Um, and before you start integrating um, your own thoughts and ideas. And I think that that's similar to the approach um, that I've learned to have over, over time, I worked previously in Chicago, you know, a lot of my work, um, you know, as an administrator, et cetera, was, you know, rooted in social practice. And even before that was really, um, you know, a, a word that was used industry-wide. And one of the, the most important parts of that work is to not to assume that just because something doesn't exist in one place, it means that it has to exist in another place in order for it to be equitable. Because what you're really talking about right now is not just about like support and finance, et cetera. What you're talking about is equity and power. You know, you're talking about how to, how the creative economy can be more equitable when it comes to, yes, financial resources, but ultimately when it comes to power. And in order for the creative economy in any place, whether it's, you know, hyper-local, uh, up to national, international, there has to be a redistribution of power, um, you know, to artists and creatives in a way that they're able to um, actively engage and make decisions that affect the way that they live and work in society. And uh, we have to look at value, um, value differently, you know, beyond, um, beyond, you know, bankers and, and, and everything else, because, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, you know, when we go to bed at night, you know, we're not, or when we get, have those real warm and fuzzy feelings, you know, it's not about, it's not about bank transactions, you know, that, that memory is from that song, it's from that dance, it's from that performance, it's from that piece of artwork you saw, that joke you heard, or, or something like that. These are, these are markers in our lives. So what I would say to engage, I would say, listen, um, I would say, find out where the artists are gathering. Um, where they're talking to each other, where they're making decisions. Um, I would find out historically what has happened before. You know, if there's an initiative that you're thinking of, has it already been tried? Has an artist tried to do it and, yes. and, and could not get the support? You know, I think a it's lot of people skip over that. Yeah, yeah. Comments, I mean, it's interesting because I think your, your comment is you're really advocating for artists to be stakeholders, to be considered as stakeholders at the table in any kind of discussion when it comes to uh, policymaking. And a lot of times we think of, uh, we, 
and to view them as to view the art community as a, as its own stakeholder. So not just the the business, the bank, the the restaurants, all the different the other segments, but also the artistic communities, which sometimes are not necessarily represented as one entity. So it's it's harder to reach and define. So right, it's it's not there's not like one person that represents all artists. So so it takes a little bit more work, and maybe perhaps that's also why they're not always at the table. So, but I think that's a really it's a great it's a great point when looking at um, revitalizing a community, when looking at strengthening the connectedness, the ties in the community to ensure that there's that that art is is uh, is at the table in those. And Absolutely, because if you're yeah. not looking at because if you're not looking at artists as stakeholders, then you have to ask yourself, then how are you looking at them? If artists are not, if artists are not considered stakeholders, if creators are not thinking, thought of as stakeholders or should, if you don't think that they should be decision makers when it comes to, or at least added to the conversation, when there are major decisions that are impacting, you know, different communities or, you know, support, you know, for the arts and performance, things that directly affect their lives and the communities in which they live, if you really believe they have no say, then what is it that you're saying about the arts? What are you saying? I mean, it, it, it really, you have to almost, again, it's about recalibrating the, the politics of thoughts and like language that we've been socialized, the things that we've been socialized to believe about artists or the creative industries, unless they're operating in what I believe in a way that is um, considered to be more, I don't know, um, more commercial or um, that has become, you know, these points of arrival, if they're at a major institution, you yeah, know, et cetera. Right. We kind of think of it as a finite, like the ones that are really recognized. Actually, we really take the arts for granted. And that was the whole purpose of this discussion is to realize um, that it's really part of part of our daily life. And I think we have to be conscious in terms of and intentional in terms of how do we participate in the creative economy is to support the creative process by interacting with artists by ensuring there is a space there is a time there are resources to help with the and education to help with the creative process is it to absolutely in the distribution which is you know using our venues using using the technology to help artists distribute their art and make it accessible to more or is it really being on the bottom side saying okay i need to be i want to include local artists i want to define the parameters of the art that i i present as part of the the other business that i'm doing right whether it is a nursing home that has art on the walls to a hotel as you were saying that has that social and musical and and experiential programming it's like how do i experience it and how do i consume it so that so that artists can continue to thrive and and really enhance our life and help us connect so i think this has been like a really great discussion and i want to thank you for taking the time to be on the on the civic leader podcast and have this discussion. I think it's enlightening and it just gives us new lands, fresh lands, especially at this time of COVID where we have not been able to um, connect with each other through the art the way we, we did. And that was the whole purpose of this is to make us- Absolutely. Or granted and, uh, and do everything we can to bring it back into our lives really well in the life. So, so thank no. you so much. Um, no, thank you. Thank you for having me. And and, and I just want to say, you know, it's, it's always great to have these types of conversations. Um, and I was excited to see that uh, the intention was rooted in, in exactly the areas that you highlighted just now. And I just want to say, like, let's normalize um, creating more spaces of support for artists in the creative economy. Let's let's normalize, um, you know, differing different ways that artists and the creative arts and creative economy can be supported at a hyper local, local, national, international level. Let's normalize uh, bringing artists, not just to the table, but being fully integrated into the process and, and being thought leaders 
um, valuing them as thought leaders and stakeholders in our communities as we're making key decisions when it comes to development, when it comes to policy making, when it comes to education, uh, ultimately we'll be all better for it. This is not some pie in the sky, you know, um, um, ideal. I mean, if nothing has has been more true in the past year is that the world could not get on um, without arts, culture, creativity, even if it's just in the form of humor um, or technology. And so I hope that, you know, people that have, have listened to our conversation um, can look at that and, and are, are encouraged to find different ways, again, to continue to support the arts and even possibly see the artists within themselves a bit more. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Jane. It's really a pleasure to meet you and uh, a real pleasure to have you uh, here on the Civic Leader Podcast. So thank you. I look forward to perhaps meeting you in person in Houston. So. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you All for right. having me. Good. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye, Janice. You have a good, you have a great day. Thank you again for participating. You too. Take care. All bye right. bye. Bye. And Sylvie Legere, thank you for listening to the Civic Leader Podcast. I invite you to continue uh, learning about art in our lives and listen to my conversation with Cynthia Noble, the Executive Director of Art on the Mart. We have a fascinating discussion on public art in our communities.